Our lesson today deals with if God is so great and God is so powerful, why is there still pain and suffering in the world? And that's a tough question. You probably heard the story of Christian Herder. He was the governor of Massachusetts and he was running for re-election and he had spent all day out campaigning, shaking hands, going from one event to another. And he was that evening at a, a church that was holding a rally for him. And he realized when he got in line to eat that he hadn't any, had anything to eat all day long. So when he went through the line, he asked the lady passing out the chicken, he says, can I have an extra piece of chicken? And she said, no, one piece of chicken per person. He said, but man, I've been out campaigning. She said, listen, one piece of chicken per person. Well, he was, I'm told, a rather unassuming man, so he decided, well, man, if there's ever time to throw your weight around as governor, this is it. And he looked at that woman, he said, ma'am, do you know who I am? I am governor of this state, and I am in charge of this state. And she said, I am in charge of the chicken. I'm the one in charge here. That's who I am. And if we look at relational conflict in your life, in almost every arena, it most always comes down to this question. Who's in charge? You think about it in profession. You think about it in sports. You think about it at work. Companies can thrive or they can barely survive because they don't resolve the question of who's in charge. I guarantee you most of your family conflict is over this question between children and their parents, between husbands and wives. There's a constant tension. Who's in charge? Even at school, even at church. And it's the primary area of tension between our relationship to God. Because quite candidly, I'm not sure we often want a God who's really large and in charge. What I've learned is almost most of us is we would prefer God to be like a jack-in-the-box that we get off the shelf when we need him. So something happens at work. Maybe they're downsizing and you might lose your job or maybe your child gets hit uh, on a bicycle by a car or maybe you find out that someone you love has cancer and you pull that box off the shelf and you crank it a little bit and God pops out and solves your problem and you put him back up on the shelf until you need him again. We like God for, to be our savior but we don't like God to be our sovereign because to be our sovereign is a 24-7 job and we're not sure we want a God that's in charge that much. But you need to know this about God. He is large, and He is in charge. That's not going to change. And it might be the last thing you want to hear. But it might be the best thing that you've ever heard. God has two things to say to us today. And number one is this. At no time, Am I ever off my throne? You've got to understand that God's sovereignty is not something that comes and goes. There's no before or after when we speak about the sovereignty of God. It's like, well, this is what the world was like before God came, became king, and this is what the world's like after he became king. You see, the sovereignty of men is something that is bestowed. We can look down on history and we can say this is the date when he became in charge or she became in charge. You can't do that with God. Psalm 93, 2. Your throne, O Lord, has been established from time immemorial. You yourself are from the everlasting past. You see, God's sovereignty wasn't bestowed. It's always existed. He's always been in charge. He always will be. Again, this is not like any other sovereign the earth has ever had. Our sovereignties come and go no matter how everlasting we might think they might be. I remember reading uh, Charles Colson, Chuck Colson's book, Life Sentence. And you, if you remember Chuck Colson, he was indicted for the Watergate scandal and the Nixon era. A lot of you are too young to remember that. But he went to prison. 
And in prison, he found Christ. And he decided when he got out of prison, he was going to dedicate his life to helping prisoners rehabilitate and get their life straight again. And he talks in this book, Life Sentence, about being in Italy and seeing the ruins of the Roman Senate. And it caused his mind to go back to the days when he was in the White House. And every day, 12 men would re re uh, meet in the Roosevelt Room with Henry Kissinger. And they would talk about events in the world. And Henry Kissinger, he said, would often say things like, the things we must decide today will shape it, the course of human history. And he said, we believe that. We really believe that we were in control of the fate of the world. Just like the Roman Empire wearing all their flowing togas and stuff, and now it's just a tourist trap. And he thought that, well, when, when's the day going to be when the Roosevelt Room is just a tourist place? You see, God alone stays in charge. There's not one maverick molecule in this entire universe that can stick its tongue out at God and say, you can't make me do it. Even the most powerful being in the universe against God still acknowledges his sovereignty. If you look at Genesis chapter 3 when God cursed the servant and said, you're going to lie on your belly and my deliverer is going to crush your head. He didn't say, oh yeah, you can't make me do that. He never said that. In the book of Job, great book about this, we read where Satan acknowledges that he could do nothing about the hedges of God. When God puts a boundary and says, Satan can't go past this hedge, he can't. He can't go under it, he can't go over it, he can't go through it. He can only do what God lets him do. Because God alone is in charge. Do you believe that? But it raises a hard question. If God is in charge, what do we do about all the evil in the world? And what some Christians want to do in their attempt to protect God is to push Him off the throne and suggest we will protect the reputation of God by suggesting he wasn't really in charge when that stuff happened. Is that what we really believe about God? That things go on that he just can't stop because he just doesn't know about it? That God's off his throne for a while and takes a vacation and comes back and says, Wow, I had no, no idea. How can God really be sovereign if he's unaware of evil or unable to do anything about it. Do not defend God in a way that diminishes him. He says, I am on the throne no matter what is going on. I am large, I am in charge, and I always have the last word. Look at Psalm or Proverbs 2130. There is no wisdom no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. So what does that mean as we wrestle with the sovereignty of God? Three quick things I'm going to show you. And the first is this. We do not need to wonder if God is in control. No matter how bad things seem to get, we don't have to worry that God has been overthrown. Think about it. How is God ever going to be threatened by a coup? So God is omni omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. Where are you going to go to meet to overflow God, overflow God? Since God is omniscient, since he knows everything, what secrets are you going to keep away from God? Since God is omnipotent, he is all-powerful, what force are you going to muster up that's going to cause him concern? Nothing. I am reminded daily in my life that there are a lot of things out of my control. I can tell you what, if I was in charge, there would be a lot of things that I would change in my life. But I have to recognize daily that I am not in charge. 
And I affirm daily that nothing is beyond the control of God. My life and your life are not a series of random events that have no meaning. Everything that happens to me, everything that happens to you is Father filtered. It has to be. And think about this. It's not enough for you to say, I believe Jesus is going to reign one day. You have to believe that Jesus reigns today or you are a practicing atheist. God's on the throne. God's on the throne when it's sunshine and God's on the throne when it's stormy. In Acts chapter 12, Herod imprisons Peter and James. And he kills James, or yeah, kills James, but in a series of miraculous uh, events, Peter is released. Now let me tell you something. God is on the throne when you're liberated, and God is on the throne when you're executed. God was on the throne when Peter got out of the jail. God was on the throne when they cut James' head off. God is on the throne. Isaiah 46, 10. Only I can tell you what is going to happen even before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. Now that almost seems like arrogance, doesn't it? That there's an arrogance of God? And, you know, we wrestle with that. But God is in charge. Which means, secondly... God does not need our permission to rule as he pleases. In fact, God does not appreciate insinuations that he's mismanaging things. That's what Job did. In the midst of his suffering, he began to imply that God wasn't running things like Job would run things if Job was in charge. And God appeared and said, Job, let's have a little talk. And here's what's going to happen. I'm going to do all the talking, and you're going to do all the listening. Where were you when I created the universe? Did you hang the stars in the sky? Do you tell the lightning what to do? Do you tell the seas how far they can go? Did you put the hump on the back of the camel? You didn't make one square inch of this physical universe. Don't tell me how to run the moral universe. You see, God needs no advice. No advice on how to accomplish his agenda. He rules however he pleases. Which means sometimes God accomplishes his mighty deeds through miracles. You ever think about that? Just ask Pharaoh. Pharaoh thought he was in charge. Until God showed up and sent some plagues to Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was in charge and said, I'm going to put these three Jewish boys in the fire and let them burn. And God said, I don't think so. Not today. When Darius threw Daniel in the lion's den, he thought he was in charge, but he found out he wasn't as sovereign as he thought he was. So sometimes God accomplishes his will with mighty miracles. But sometimes God does what he wants from his throne through what we might call seemingly insignificant details that we often go unrecognized until long past. Have you ever gone through anything in your life and you didn't know what was going on or why it was going on and five years later you're like... Oh, the light bulb goes on. That's what God was doing. Joseph had no idea through a series of what seemed like unfair events that God was putting him in the right place to meet the right people to someday be in a position to save his family and a whole nation from starvation. Ruth is this unheard of, no-named Moabite widow who just happens to be at the right place at the right time to meet the right people to one day be the grandmother of David. Esther, a little Jewish virgin who's, who through a series of coincidences just happens to 
be where she needs to be to save her people from extinction. Listen, God accomplishes his will however he pleases, however he wants to, whenever he wants to. Which means sometimes God accomplishes his will by allowing trials and suffering. Ask Stephen. Ask Paul if God can use pain and persecution and slander and hardship and even martyrdom to accomplish the agenda of his throne. God dispenses. And God disposes that which will bring him glory, including adversity. Psalm 115.3, our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. Psalm 135.6, the Lord does whatever pleases him in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and all their depths. Doing what he thinks is best is part of the job description of being in charge. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, I'm cool with that. God can do whatever he wants. I just need for God to give me a, some clarity, some communicated understanding of what he's all about. And then I'm okay with that. Well, you need to know something else about the God who's large and in charge. Number three, God doesn't need to explain his ways. To us. I remember one time when my kids were real little and the two of them were sitting in the back seat and I'm driving. I don't know where we were going, but I hear this little voice in the back. Do you know where you're going? Do you appreciate when someone who has no clue asks you if you do? Because that's what we do with God. He, he who is from eternity past and eternity future, who has always existed and always will exist, and there you are in your timeline of history, your little blip, your little nanosecond of existence, and you're trying to judge God on how he's operating. You can't even make sense of your own life, let alone scrutinize God. God is going to do whatever reveals his glory. And he's going to do it even if at that moment you can't understand what he's up to. And that's especially true when it comes to God's relationship to suffering and evil. God doesn't ordain evil. But God is so large and in charge, even evil must submit to his sovereignty. So God took the most evil thing that's ever been done, the murder of his own son, and even make that reveal his glory. You've got to come to terms with this one reality. If you could figure out God, if you knew everything he was up to, he would be too puny and not worthy of your worship. Romans 11. Oh, what a wonderful God we have. How great are his riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible is it is for us to understand his decisions and his methods. For who can know what the Lord is thinking? Who knows he enough to be his counselor? And who could ever give him so much that he would have to pay it back? For everything comes from him. Everything. Everything, even suffering, exists by his power and is intended for his glory forever and ever. To him be the glory evermore. Amen. Some of you might be familiar with this picture that I have here. This is St. Peter's Cathedral. Built by Mark Michelangelo. Did some fantastic paintings. And oh, just what a... A structure that he built. I don't know if you know the whole story, but when he was building it, some of his workers started to rebel because they couldn't understand what he was doing. 
And he got them all together and he said, listen, if I could explain my vision to you, which I'm not obligated to you, I don't think I could. You'll just have to wait till the end. You'll just have to trust me now. And then when it's complete, you'll know. They didn't need more comprehension. They just needed to trust. And so do you. When it comes to God's sovereignty, we don't need more understanding. We need more faith. The proper response to the reign of God is not to explain Him, not to defend Him, but to worship Him. Some of you know the name Matt Redman. He's a Christian singer and a Christian songwriter, wonderful songwriter. He and his wife were visiting New York City in September of 2001 when two planes flew into the World Trade Center. And he began to look for music to try to help him deal with that and communicate the feelings that we had over 9-11. And he recognized that there's hardly any music for such an event. So he wrote a song in response to 9-11. A good song. And one of the verses goes this way. Blessed be your name. When the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your, your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, I will still say, blessed be the name of the Lord. And then the song closes with the, the inspired Job response back in the book of Job. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You see, Matt Redman understood what Job learned, that more important than knowing why is knowing who. It's enough to know that God is large and in charge. David put it best in Psalm 11, 3 through 4. The foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? But the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord still rules from heaven. So it doesn't matter how evil things seem or how much you're hurting. At no time does God ever say, I'm off my throne. And number two, as we close, in no way can anything frustrate, God says, your hope in me. God's purposes cannot be undermined. They cannot be overruled. And do you know what that means? Nothing you go through is irredeemable. Let me say that again. God's on the throne. He's never threatened. He's never challenged. He's never overruled. He's never undermined. He's always in charge. That means nothing you've done or nothing that's going, you're going through is irredeemable. God can reveal His glory through anybody and anything that they're going through. We're going to close with a video. This video is a little bit longer than you're used to. It's about five minutes long. But it really says probably better than I can stand up here and try to explain it, what I'm trying to say. And then after this video, the worship team's going to come up, and I'm going to come up, and we're going to have a closing prayer. And that's going to be it. So whenever you're ready, start the video. Dear Elliot, Right now, you are two months from being born. We just found out that you have trisomy 18, also called Edwards Syndrome. Doctors tell us that you won't likely make it to birth. Your mom and I are praying against that. We're praying for healing. We are praying for nothing less than a miracle. You are our first child, and the day of your birth couldn't come sooner. Dear Elliot, 
You were born today weighing in at six pounds. You are already a miracle to us. Your mom is doing well, and it looks like we'll be hanging out here at the hospital a little longer. Dear Elliot, today you turned 11 days old. We are so proud of you. Today we celebrated your 11th birthday. In fact, we do that every day at 4.59, the time you were born. Dear Elliot, we've been home for a week now, so that's why you don't see your nurses anymore. It's great to have you home. Today I think we'll pack up everything and take our first venture out for coffee. Dear Elliot, I don't know if you've noticed, but you're connected to some tubes. The doctors say we have to keep these in so you can get oxygen to breathe. You are also fed through a feeding tube. We feed you every three hours and it takes an hour and a half to do it. We've loved learning how to best take care of you. We love it. Lots of people email, call, and send cards on your behalf. You're well loved. It's 11 at night right now and my feeding shift has just begun. Mom is asleep and the best part of my day has begun. My shift ends around 4.45 a.m. when your mom takes over. She cherishes her mornings with her boy. Today you turn one month old. I didn't know if I'd ever get to say that. To top off the day, 20 friends showed up at the door for a true surprise birthday party for you. They sang, brought balloons, and a birthday cake. It was beautiful chaos. At 2 a.m. this morning, your feeding tube came out. We had been warned this may happen eventually. We quickly realized we did not have a stethoscope, which was necessary to replace the tube. Since our neighbor was a nurse, I went ahead and knocked on their door at 2.30 a.m. They found their stethoscope and your mom went to it. After much wrestling, praying, and your tears, the tube was down and you were able to feed. Just so you know, your mom is my hero. Dear Elliot, you now weigh seven pounds, three ounces. You're growing and your food has been bumped up because of your good appetite. You continue to find new ways to steal our hearts. Dear Elliot, today marks two months of your life. Your mom and I are so thankful we know you. We know your face, your noises. We know that bath time and massage are your favorite daily activity. You finally learned how to suck your thumb by yourself. Because of trisomy 18, you were born with clenched fist, and being able to do this is actually quite difficult. Way to go, son. Dear Elliot, we celebrate your birthday every day with a picture. Lately, we've tried to get a bit more creative. Dear Elliot, I realize you can get frustrated with your tubes and your frequent congestion. Please know that your mom and I are doing everything we can to make you comfortable. Dear Elliot, well you tipped the scales today at eight pounds, 14 ounces, quite an accomplishment. You also have managed to grow a pretty decent mullet. Dear Elliot, we all got to go to a reunion at the hospital. I've never seen your mom more happy. The joy she felt getting to show off her son can't be described with words. In fact, she compared it to the way a mother would feel when her son becomes president or wins a Heisman or develops a cure for cancer. The logic of medicine says you shouldn't be alive, but you are. You are such a fighter. Dear Elliot, you have now passed the three month mark. You also got your first cordless pictures taken today. No feeding tube, oxygen, or stickers. This was no small accomplishment, but we got it done. Have I told you lately that we are so proud of you? Dear Elliot, today you went to be with Jesus. An underdeveloped lung, a heart with a hole in it, and DNA that placed faulty information into each and every cell of your body could not stop God from revealing himself through a child who never uttered a word. Not a pulpit, not a slick presentation, not a best-selling book, but a six-pound boy with trisomy 18. God found great pleasure to take a lowly thing in the eyes of the world and show truth. At your funeral, we released 99 balloons, each balloon representing a day of your life. How beautiful it was to watch, how quickly they were gone. And so today, we celebrate. Elliot, you are well. And although we miss you more than we can express, we're only separated from you by our time left on earth. See you soon, son, mom and dad.
Wow. Let's pray. Father, a long time ago I gave up the arrogance of of thinking that it's my job to try to explain you and I've just decided it's wiser and healthier just to trust you, to believe you are large and in charge. Someday maybe we'll understand. But Father, hell took its best shot at your throne. It murdered your boy. It threw him in a hole. And three days later, that stone was rolled away and Jesus announced to the universe he's king of kings and lord of lords and your throne never wobbled once i have decided that that's where i want to put my hope that you are in charge and father it's my prayer that others here today believe the same thing in jesus name we pray amen